this is going to be a, a double act, myself and, and Brian down here. I'm really just going to speak for a few minutes to introduce the project and I'm going to hand over to Brian who's going to um, go into uh, some more detail. So, um, just start the clock. So, um, the Palace Void project, um, I suppose like all interesting projects, this grew out of a number of, of, of sort of themes um, and a certain amount of kind of contingency and serendipity as well. So insofar as there's ever a beginning for anything, it begins with um, this archaeological artefact, the Palace Boy Vessel, which was um, discovered in a bog in uh, County Westmeath in, in Ireland in 2002. It was excavated by the um, by the Irish Archaeological Wetland Unit, sitting under excavation up there, Conor McDermott uh, directed the excavations. Now, because this is a, is a, a peatland site, remarkable organic preservation of this, this older wood vessel. So this is an Iron Age vessel, um, and you can see you can see the quality of the, the work on it and the quality of the preservation. So I suppose this sort of be, began, I, I, would, I would use the Palace Boy vessel in some of my teaching. Um, Aidan O'Sullivan and Robert van der Noort wrote a very interesting object biography of this vessel. <coughs> so when I was teaching wetland archaeology, I, I would use I would use this vessel and use what they'd written about it in my teaching. <coughs> and I find myself saying, making statements about the Palace Boy vessel, particularly about its crafting and how it'd been made. I find myself saying things like, obviously it was a very fine vessel that must have taken a long time to make. Things like that. And I kind of started reflecting on it, going, well, actually. I don't really know if, if these things I'm saying about how this vessel was created are, are true at all. I, I don't work wood. Um, I had, it occurred to me I had no idea how long it would take to, to make this sort of vessel, the processes that it would involve. So that was sort of, that was sort of one theme that was, sort of, uh, was running around. This eventually led on to the Palace Boy project. Um, there's four of us involved in, in this project, myself, uh, Cathy Moore, uh, Mark Griffiths <coughs> and, and Brian. So, uh, um, and again, there was a certain amount of, of, of luck and contingency involved here because I've been sort of reflecting on Palace Boy and thinking, well, I, I really must speak to a woodworker about this. I must ask them about 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 the processes that would go into the creation of this sort of vessel. And it so happened I had a conversation with my brother, and he said, "Oh, you, should, you must speak to um, my friend Mark. He, he's a he's a he's a master woodworker." So I had a conversation with with, um, with Mark, and we chatted about it, and we looked at some pictures. He said some very interesting things about woodworking that. that automatically kind of got me thinking and around the same time there's this another, another theme running which is actually going back going back um, two summers now we realised earlier when we were thinking about this um, I'd had conversations with Brian um, in the course of his studies in, in Cork um, and Brian also has a background in archaeology as well so we'd had, we'd had various sort of discussions and thoughts about maybe ways we might collaborate and that, that led to this trip out to the west of Ireland that actually involved them um, the colleague in the, Saren pulling a face over there sorry Saren yes into the west of Ireland where we, we went to look at landscapes and Brian accompanied us he took, he took some photographs and we had a lot of conversations about sort of art and archaeology you know as you do we drank quite a lot of beer as well it was all, it was, it was all great fun just a couple of pictures and um, Brian was recording as he went along, so we, we had a great afternoon looking at uh, some of the Cork and Kerry rock art, and again, you see these fantastic photos that, um, that, that Brian took. And um, I suppose it was shortly after this, or several months after this, we sort of had these themes running together um, that led to the Palace Boy project. So it's to my interest in these processes of crafting and creation, um, the Palace Boy vessel, Brian's interest in, well, I think probably now is a good time to hand you over to Brian and let him kind of pick up the story. <coughs> Hello. Um, yeah, I kind of laughed when I saw the the name for the the session because it kind of summed up my own identity crisis over the last few years. Um, archaeologist is something my friend Paul calls me. He's a painter, um, and I was always struggling in terms of what I should be called. Um, um, even when I was an archaeologist, which I spent 15 years doing, and you know I have a degree and an MA in it, but um, I still never felt comfortable saying I am an archaeologist because I never felt fully committed to the discipline or the or the, the profession. Um, and the same applies to saying I'm an artist because I, I don't think I've made enough art to say I'm an artist. So that's what my friend Paul calls me an archaeologist. Um, so how did I end up? becoming involved in art so much 
Well, during my archaeology career, I got invo- I specialised in surveying and historic building surveys and project management, that kind of stuff. And it led me to this house in Canturk, where um, in County Cork, where I ended up acquiring a huge archive from this house pre-demolition. And I was very frustrated by my kind of tendency to do things photographically, archaeologically, systematically, and it was very. It, you, I could never do everything perfectly to satisfy any one discipline, and it was kind of beginning to get on my nerves. So, um, with that in mind, I I quit archaeology, um, but in 2012. Um, for various reasons, but um, dur- during shortly afterwards, I kind of started to volunteer and get some employment in arts administration, and I ended up hanging out with artists, curators, um, arts professionals, and a lot of people that were, were in art college, and I became very jealous of art students because they were doing exactly what I wanted to do. They were doing things without being confined to drawing inspiration or information from any one particular source. They were drawing on philosophy, sociology, politics, history. I was like, this, this is where I should be. So um, I took a chance and I applied for an MA in Fine Art in the Crawford College of Art and Design, which was based on the third floor of this brutalist um, building, which is going to be demolished next year, which also fitted into my obsession with abandoned spaces and pre-demolition. Um, so I knew people doing this MA and I read the prospectus and it basically described exactly what I needed to progress my archive project. Now, I started doing the MA um, intending to work on exclusively that kind of art art project, the archive project, and my tutors warned me against it because I I was too wrapped up in it. I'd already been working on the project for about eight or nine years at that stage, and not getting very far because I was busy working on that. But um, I started to, we we collectively made the decision that I was going to analyse archaeological behaviour and my own behaviour through artistic research and an artistic line of inquiry. Now this phrase, artistic line of inquiry, was new to me and it's brilliant because artistic research and artistic lines of inquiry are like those lines we were talking about earlier. They can just, it can go anywhere and draw on so many different resources. So I went back to this project I'd started, which is a um, (coughs) project that uses visual cues to explore um, a hidden narrative of a space. And this is basically a factory where manufacturing has um, been lost to the east. Um, I ended up doing a performance to video, which I had no intention of doing, but that was because somebody backfilled the hole with gravel when I got there one morning. So I had to tidy it up to photograph it better. But all, all the art came out of that, and I made it, you know, a video piece that I'm quite happy with in the end. It's all online, which I'll, you can look at. Um, another project I did during the MA, um, I was looking at osteologists, particularly people that do facial reconstructions. Um, and how familiar and tactile they are with human remains. Um, and I ended up basically creating a moving photograph which is projected on the wall of the gallery there. That's like a, um, there's no sound, but what I wanted to do is take away the kind of description that the osteologist was talking about and focus on the behavior with the hands. And you can see in the photograph in the gallery, she's patting the head almost like a pet. Um, and I found that kind of fascinating. Um, the project I finished on in the MA was to do with the spaces through which human remains pass and our perception of them um, when the person is ab- absent and the body is absent. Um, so my in, in that photograph, there's four of the eight in the series. So there's um, the morgue, that's the IT table. It's a beach I found a body on in 1997. Um, my friend's living room, where he was laid out in his coffin um, when he died of leukemia. His father was laid out there shortly after. So an unusual space, not I- immediately is identifiable. Uh, a catafalque, um, which is the platform that the coffin rests on in the crematorium. Um, other locations were the funeral home, um, a crypt, and I think that was it. So, um, research wise, I went on to study, I tried to kind of sum up what it w- was that my behaviour was kind of leaning towards um, in archaeology and in art, and it came down to anteriority, absence, and effect. Now, by anteriority, I mean anything that's gone before in time absence that of the human subject and a, an affect in the context of affect theory um, I think I'll just read out what I defined it as in my research paper um, I'd read all this stuff in affect theory philosophers, all these people and it, it's very impenetrable language this is my own definition um, an involuntary and immediate reading of an external stimulus using a combination of senses but in the moment experienced by the body and the mind as a whole although intrinsically 
linked to emotion, affect is immediate and not triggered by process thought, memories are observed and interpreted behaviour or communication. And it sums up exactly what the other speaker was talking about on an archaeological site. That is that, uh, basically happening. Um, so as part of my research, I looked into how archaeology, um, and more specifically runes, had influenced artists to date. I also looked at how archaeological and archival processes could be used in an art context and how it contributes to the making and viewing experience. Um, the other area I was looking at was incidental process derived aesthetics. This is a thing I came up with as well. Just to, I was kind of having fun with myself and how language is used in both disciplines. Um, um, the in joke here for me during my MA presenting this was that this looked like a Harris Matrix. Of course, none of my art, <laughs> none, none of my art um, colleagues got it, but um, I had a bit of a laugh anyway. Um, so I approached this subject. It, basically, what I was talking about is that when you do a section phase on an archaeological site, it can look pretty. Um, that's kind of a very basic um, example. Um, it, it serves no purpose for it to be aesthetically pleasing, but it is. Um, so I wanted to look at that phenomenon, but I also use two other disciplines as a control. So I use geology and Tyndall Nat Natural Institute, which is kind of um, a physics institute. Um, so like in geology, things are formed naturally, and in physics, it's done scientifically. So that, that's kind of where I was going with it. Um, I sent out these emails, it's really interesting, I described it like fishing, you send out these emails with this very kind of arty request for collaboration and you see who bites and luckily Ben was one of the, the two people, three people in the archaeology department that um, was up for it. Now Ben's talked about going out to the bog, this was my highlight. Um, I've always dreamed in my archaeological career of digging sections for no other reason other than to enjoy digging them and to present them, <laughs> to, present them to look fantastic. Um, so. Ben said he, we may get to go back here and finish this one. I'm going to hold him to it. Because um, if you imagine that section just completed and us allowing those plants to hang over it, and it might tell us something, it might not, but I'd be pleased. Anyway, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Um, so the Palace Boy Vessel Project, um, I think Ben had in mind that like we, need, we needed to record the project. Um, and I went in with my eyes open as an artist archaeologist and that my, I was still recording, my responsibility was to record, so I was still identifying with that role. Um, but I also hoped to kind of use my creative eye and where possible have the odd kind of creative tangent or flourish, but um, I knew it was going to be difficult because I had to be focused on the task at hand. So I was using a digital SLR and a zoom recorder. Um, I wasn't that used to filming, I'd only tried it out in my MA a couple of times, so it was a bit of a learning curve. Um, let's see where I'm going. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so Ben wanted to explore the creative processes involved. Um, so it seemed appropriate like that somebody cr creative was involved in the recording process as well. Um, and art graduates are cheaper than, uh, than, um, <laughs> than, than <coughs> film professionals. Um, so the editing process as well, another learning curve. But um, after the kind of funding ran out and I found that, okay, editing takes a while, I didn't know this, um, it came apparent that I, I, I had more creative control now that I knew I was on my own time. And that kind of was an interesting point in relation to this session and what some of the questions were. Um, so once it once kicked off, um, my first day of recording was when we first met Mark, he came over to see the original vessel conserved in the National Museum facility. Um, I then took it upon myself to find the tree, because I thought it was a fascinating part of the project, to find this tree. And um, we all naively thought we'd just walk into kind of alder stores and order certain alder from off the shelf, um, and soon found out that all these timber yards were like, you're not going to find an alder that big, um, it would be very difficult. Um, a few people recommended this guy, um, David Brabazon, who was like the Indiana Jones of tree sourcing in Ireland. Um, he's a really interesting guy. Um, but he, st he started me off on the search um, where he had a holiday home in Mayo um, and we found a lot of these kind of ones, crooked, narrow, uh, thin alders starting to rot in damp ground. Um, we ended up finding it on his land in Wicklow um, and then it all became very apparent that like, okay, we found the tree, now we have to chop it down and it turns out to be a very rare specimen and all of a sudden all the gills started flooding in and we were like, okay, that we better make this worthwhile. So I'll get back to that later. Um, so that's the tree. Um, we set up a Facebook page and a blog, um, which has been great. Um, we've got a lot of interest internationally from specialists and the likes. Um, yeah. 
Now, one of the most exciting and memorable moments for me um, definitely was when the when uh, David and his wife Sheila delivered the tree and its its spare. Basically, the spare log as well. We had kind of notions of trying stuff out on the spare. It didn't really happen. But um, when it was brought to Metal Mara, which is like a community boatyard in Cork, um, the the boat builders all started to come out of the workshop kind of very quietly in with their kind of mouths open. They had never seen a piece of alder this big. They knew exactly what it was straight away. Um, and it was a kind of a timeless moment where they were all kind of touching it, sniffing it, whispering about it. It was incredible. And they started to treat David with this huge respect that he had found it, that he owned it, um, and that he had more p things like it on his land. He was, he was like the person that owned um, a land of treasures. It was really quite something. Um, this was a great place to work, by the way. We couldn't have really done it without them. It turned out to be perfect in many ways. Um, there was difficulties with sound recording and stuff because of all the power tools, but it was a um, fascinating place. So, um, so, yeah, we got started and it was kind of the main interest was the creative process involved for the woodworker, but also the experience of the viewer. and. Um, this ties in with all my interest in affect because I was kind of fascinated by the viewer and how everybody said it is an amazing experience just to be here, I could stay here all day, I want to watch what happens. It was a connection with the material and the kind of craft, but also just the, the object had a presence in the space when it was a tree, when it later became an artifact. Um, and this was something that was really interesting. So I was kind of raised some questions as to like, what purpose does it serve our species to enjoy the observation of making. Um, are we hardware to enjoy so that we can learn from watching? Um, was it a matter of survival in the past to watch somebody making something? And this ties into another area of research that I won't get into now, but um, I'm kind of going to pursue that a bit more because these, these kind of experiences are harder to find now where we're actually sitting in front of somebody making. Um, and they are quite powerful experiences when we get the chance. Um, uh, on the first day, I said to Mark, um, this is like an episode of Hands, I'm in an episode of Hands, um, which is like an RTE um, documentary series from years back, which um, had a different craft per episode. And Mark actually said there and then, he said, the episode on woodwork is why I'm a woodworker. So that was his inspiration. So that kind of sums it up. That he, he'd, Even through a television, he had been inspired. So what does a record, a visual record of this project look like? A lot of pictures like this of Mark at work using different tools. Um, the material itself changing during the, the crafting, it's famously kind of associated with death because of these blood spatters that appear through the, through, through the wood, the, the sap um, comes out red. Um, there's another shot of how it looked later, different kind of materials. The tools themselves, we were using replica and contemporary tools um, to kind of test which is better. Um, how you use the tools in different ways, <coughs> how the wood reacts to the tools, the marks left behind, the waste, um, which was fascinating. Um, Kathy remarked that she, she was blown away by how many individual strikes it takes to make something like this. You can't even perceive it when you look at the finished object, but when you look at something like that, you see every one of those represents a single blow. So it's um, quite something. Um, I heard from another couple of photographers that because I, I was busy managing um, an event in the city towards the end, so uh, Murin, who's pictured there, was photographed by Owen O'Connell, a friend of mine. Um, he caught a good moment of an injury to a hand. Um, Murin's favorite, my favorite photographs of Murin's are this one. It looked like a, a gang of bikers had visited the site. Um, I think they were just guys in for the men's shed kind of thing or something like that. But um, um, great picture. Um, and this one of the guys getting the the vessel into the museum, like the Iron Age bobsleigh team. Or something. Um, so um, I wasn't there when they, the guys installed in the museum. So all my experience on the MA in, in, in art kind of had me, I don't know, primed to position it a certain way and limit information and contribute to viewer experience and all this kind of thing. So when I got in there eventually, um, I changed the orientation so that you could see the detail on the sides, only the small one of the small sides was in shadow. 
I also removed the signage and the, and the print that had our leaflet on it, just so I could photograph it and imagine it how I would like to encounter it. Um, obviously, with a museum, there's restrictions. You've got to have health and safety issues, and you get to tell people that they could touch it, but they couldn't climb on it. That kind of thing. Um, yeah, so that's some of the marks on it. It's a book. Um, so yeah. Um, during the crafting, I was became aware of the kind of the sounds that were happening, like the um, crafting sounds, the the resonance in the object itself, um, even the power tools in the background. It was all um, quite interesting. And the fact that I was trying to record sound made me even more aware. So I was listening to it back. Um, so um, I had been to a number of sound art events in Cork City. It has quite quite a healthy sound art community. And this is the Sonic Vigil, in, um, which happens annually in St. Anne's in Shandon. They remove all the church pews, and the place is occupied for a whole day by sound artists. They come and go, the public come and go. Um, it's kind of like a meditative, kind of creative, uh, improvised kind of performance. It's, it's quite something. Um, very enjoyable, um, kind of relaxing. Um, and it's very imaginative. Like You can't really see a lot of it here, but um, the tools that they use, the palette of instruments, as they call it, um, are quite wacky. Um, but some people end up closing their eyes, but still they're not distracted by the fact that somebody's, I don't know, hitting a wire brush or something. It just kind of, it's, um, it's, it's all about the sound. So I, I, I ended up approaching three, well, two sound artists, um, experimental percussionists, and this a third artist came on board closer to the time. I'd been helping her install her exhibition, and she kind of wanted to, she wanted to play too. Um, so. Um, I didn't know what to expect, to be honest, but then they brought an amazing um, array of tools to the museum, um, wired it up as if it was getting ready for an operation, um, with all these little mics. Um, that's kind of the, some of the stuff that they use, so it's completely <laughs> bonkers. Um, yeah. <laughs> completely mad. Um, uh, there's Ben's. Ben's face <laughs> sums it up perfectly. <laughs> um, uh, so we had to keep the audience limited. The invites were limited because it wasn't a performance space. Um, but um, we invited kind of some sound artists. There's Paul on the left who um, coined the archaeology phrase. Um, so these two people here, for example, are two of the sound artists based in Cork. They're also part of um, uh, the Domestic Godless, which is a food art collective, um, as well as being sound artists. Um, and the last event I was at of theirs was in a gallery I did some work for, and it, they were dressed in wetsuits. They were serving um, <coughs> seaweed, vodka, um, cap uh, mussel cappuccinos, um, fish bone crisps, and it was all kind of served on a big platter on top of an upturned boat in the gallery. Um, quite amazing. Um, so amazingly, they have interest in doing an event with us next for the, the Palace Boy Vessel, so stay tuned. There could be um, something interesting. <coughs> but, um, I also plan to go back to the site where of the, the of discovery for the vessel um, to examine the kind of context as it is now, which is now heavily harvested bog. Um, I also plan to go back to the where the tree was felled. Um, and I also have all the debit, well, a lot of the debitage from the crafting process in my studio because I couldn't let go of it. We all became very attached to the object. So when I actually brought it home to burn it in the fire, I couldn't do it. So I had to, I had to hold on to it. So I'm, I'm currently like keeping the moss alive on my wall in the studio. Um, but I don't, don't know quite what I'm going to do with it, but it's probably going to form part of an installation in an exhibition I'm having in January um, before I exit my graduate residency. I've been there a second year. I had a graduate residency. That's the studio, that's inside the Brutalist building, that's what it looks like when it's studios. Um, and that is it. So um, the videos the videos of the sounding, the Palace Boy sounding is what we call the sound art event, and the, the video of the crafting, and they're both um, on Vimeo, and you can access that via our website or the blog, and you can find out about more my work on theworkingrecord.com, which is my blog, and that's my email. So thanks very much.